Today I'm speaking with Henry Shookman. Henry is a long-term Zen practitioner, and he runs the Mountain Cloud Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And his latest book is One Blade of Grass, a Zen memoir. And as you'll hear immediately, Henry is quite a congenial voice. It was really great to talk to him. For the first hour, we get into his background as a meditator. And in the second hour, we get into the experience side of things and get deep into how Zen koan practice works and into concepts like emptiness and related matters. Anyway, I think you'll find it quite interesting. And now I bring you Henry Shookman. I am here with Henry Shookman. Henry, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a, I'm a big fan, by the way, so it's, it's a great honor. Oh, nice. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were set up by um, David Krakauer, the really wonderful biologist who is running the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, I don't know what, what your connection is with him, but I believe it was an email from him that put us together. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've known David a little while. He actually... I, way back I, when I was a young man, I wrote a book about New Mexico, about searching for D.H. Lawrence, mm -hmm. traces of D.H. Lawrence's time in New Mexico. And, um, we, we, and we, he read that and we met through friends and, um, we actually, it turns out I have a fair amount in common as, as Jewish guys living in New Mexico who grew up in England and both <laughs> did time at Oxford one way right. or another. So that's a small demographic, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. I don't think there are so many of us. A, I do actually know a couple of others who fit huh. that strange category, but not many. Is David a meditator? Is he, I, 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 the conversation I had with him didn't go in that direction at all. Does he have a, an interest in these esoteric things? Well, I, I wouldn't like to speak for him, but I don't think he's a meditator. He's right. quite interested in Zen. He's actually been to our Zendo a couple of times. And he, he, you know, the subject comes up when we meet. I think he's, there are certain kinds of, you know, insights or experience that Zen, you know, maybe has a bit more emphasis on than other kinds of meditation that seem plausible to him. Mm. I think it would, or at least interesting and not kind of, I think he also knows some physicists who are meditators and or Zen meditators. Right. And so he's got a little bit of a, I, I don't think he's deeply interested personally, but somewhat, uh, you know, what's the word, through others, vicariously. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I want to get into your, your whole story and what it is you um, teach. But um, first, just kind of summarize your current situation now. Where are you teaching and what's your potted biography? <laughs> Well, I just actually wrote my potted, potted biography in the form of a book that's only just come out called One Blade of Grass, and, yeah, um, nice. which, which um, tells how I got into meditation in my early 20s as a result of many years of suffering from chronic eczema mm. and associated sort of mental health issues that came with that. And, the, and I regard meditation as having been crucially helpful for me in overcoming that. And I could get into why and how I see the sort of neuroscience behind that improvement working, you know, and what meditation did. But, I, but as a result of that, I kept meditating and I've done so for over 30 years now. And along the way, I found, I found my way to Zen as I mean, having done various other kinds of meditation and actually still, you know, even after sort of getting into Zen, I still did other kinds of meditation from time to time. But, it, but in the end, I, well, not the end, but along the way, I, I was authorized as a Zen teacher by my, one of my masters. And um, so right now, and for the last nine years, I've been leading Mountain Cloud Zen Center in, in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Not something I could ever have dreamt of doing, actually. I mean, I was the unlikeliest person to really even be a meditator, let alone a, a guide to others. I was very, very restless, was very, you know, quite anxious, quite sort of ill at ease in myself, you know, for 
for much of my early life and mm. it was yeah but 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 you know but but the 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 practice really delivered and you know i'm sure there's more but it really helped in very in very significant ways for in my biography anyway so well yeah well let's take it from the beginning how did you get into meditation and what was the first practice and what was the proximate cause of your your interest <laughs> Yeah, I was I was in London doing a PhD on in Homeric studies. I'd uh, long been kind of into Homer. I started reading Greek at a young age, or started learning Greek at a young age in England, and um, and I was I was, you know, I was really basically I was very unhappy, and I mean it wasn't I, I was kind of functional, but but miserable and. Mm -hmm. I had particular, in particular one good friend who was in a similar sort of station in life to me. You know, he wasn't actually a postgraduate student, but he was, he was a composer and but trying to find his way in London. And, and he was not unhappy. And, and, and he had as much cause to be as I did, but he was he, sort of cheerful. And flourishing, of course, there's a lot of temperament in that, but there was also the fact that he meditated, and he plus the fact that the there was a the, the the only kind of meditation that was widely not even widely but somewhat known at the time in London this is mid eighties or late eighties was t m transcendental meditation, mm -hmm. which I imagine may have been a sort of gate of entry for many and that's so that's what i I started out on, and I mean, I guess the fact that Beatles had done it kind of helped, and you know, made it a little bit more sort of approachable or respectable or something. And um, and actually, they also had a tremendous discount for graduate students. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. Yeah, it yeah, that. No, it's, it's, it's seen that quite time. quite a uh, an operation, if not a racket, depending on how you view it. <laughs> well, I have to, say, from my from my perspective, it wasn't a racket. It helped a lot. You know, it really. I mean, just, I think anything that induced me to be still for 20 minutes twice a day, which was the last thing I wanted to do, would probably have been helpful. But the fact that it was, you know, it was involving calming down the nervous system and I don't know about the magic of the mantra. I was always a bit skeptical about that, but which is, you know, you, you, you get given a mantra. Yeah. It all seemed slightly sort of hocus pocus to me, but I was desperate enough to give it my best shot and i did and i was very diligent with it and within a within really even a few months i was i was noticing significant sort of changes in my state of mind and my state of well-being mm -hmm. and my skin started to sort of calm down i mean it took a while but over years it gradually got better and better do you actually you think there was a psychogenic cause of the eczema or, or, or stress was exacerbating it or how do, how do you view that causality there yeah no it's it's it is a bit difficult actually the kind of eczema i had dyshydrotic atopic dermatitis is called is which is one of the more common kinds is well they say it has a multifactorial etiology meaning mm. that many factors may play a part and really it's not very clear actually how it see, there seems to be a genetic element to it that comes down through the mother, it, along with asthma and hay fever. It sort of travels kind of with them, but it's not, um, it's not allergic, probably, mm. usually. And it's, but, but there does seem that there may be a stress element in how serious it is and how exacerbated it is at any particular time. And I think in my own case, there clearly was a kind of chronic stress factor. And um, I think while once, the, once my nervous system was beginning to calm down and get more regulated, in a way, I'd say sort of the climate in which the internal climate, internal physiological, neurophysiological climate in which the eczema had flourished, changed. And it became a little harder for it to do so well mm. in the new atmosphere, so to speak. I mean, I, maybe that sounds a bit weird, but, but yeah, I think there was a stress factor. 
but there were other factors too. I mean, my, my diet, I got better advice on diet and I exercised better. And I actually, I, I also gave up my PhD, which was an enormous, <laughs> there's a start. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> and got a job and that's good. And medicine. Actually, while, you know, and I also got started on my life as a writer around then. Mm -hmm. Very luckily I'd written a book when I was very young and it got picked up by a publisher, uh, well, two publisher in Britain and America. And I sort of started out on a new life and you know, it was, yeah, circumstances changed significantly externally as well as internally. Nice. So at what point did the practice, whether it was TM or, or anything you began after that, begin to disclose to you a, an inner landscape of mind that was deeper and more interesting and more transformative than the mere mitigation of the suffering you were aware you had. When did this open up to you as a, as a real path towards something more fundamental? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, I had had a, a strange experience when I was 19 years old. This is before you, you started TM? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A few years before. I was uh, actually standing on a beach looking at the sun setting or the sun getting low in the sky. And um, I had just recently finished the first draft of what would become my first book. And I was feeling kind of good about life and mm. staring at the water, bright, bright water on the ocean and pondering the fact that water is basically transparent and the air is basically transparent. And yet the surface of the sea was so utterly vivid and palpable almost, you know, such a sort of strong phenomenon, mm. even though it was really just the meeting of two transparent media. And as I was just, I don't know, just ruminating on that or reflecting on that, just suddenly out of nowhere, I, I guess I had a sort of random epiphany or something where, you know, suddenly I ceased to be separate from what I was looking at hmm. would be one way of putting it. It was a, it was a very powerful, but utterly baffling and very, very beautiful experience. I mean, it left me in a state of deep energized peace for, for weeks actually. Mm. And, wow. um, and a sense of transparency and weightlessness and ease in the world that was very unfamiliar to me. And I, I, I sort of had the strong sense that I'd seen something real, but I had no idea what it was or why I'd seen it or, you know, I, 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 I'd grown up in Oxford, England, where both my parents were professors in a totally sort of, you know, you know, empiricist, positivist, logical world. And I, it was not a religious upbringing. Not at all. No, my mm -hmm. dad was, well, he was Jewish, but completely non-religious. My mom actually became religious, well, she became a priest much later. But when I was a kid, when we were kids, we three kids, you know, she, there was no religion in our life to speak of. Not really. There was a little bit at school in English schools there still is actually sort of mm -hmm. customary hymn singing and stuff like that. But I mean, it was just nonsense to us. We, I thought of it as fairy tales really. And actually I didn't really. When this moment happened, it didn't occur to me it was religious because it was so mm. real and religion was a sort of fantasy world as far as I was concerned. Mm. And, um, so I took it to be some kind of insight into the nature of consciousness or something, you know, it was, I mean, honestly, I really didn't have a framework for understanding it. Actually, I didn't, I didn't know anything about, I mean, at that time I'd never heard of for example, the new age, you know, mm -hmm. that hadn't reached Oxford. And I, yeah. I hadn't, I didn't, I had no interest in mysticism and, you know, I'd, I'd never heard of Maslow and peak experiences or, or, or anything like that. I, I just thought, what the hell was that? Had you ever taken any drugs? Have you, has there been a, a psychedelic component to your journey or not? No, later, actually, I, uh, I did take ayahuasca. Mm which was very powerful, but not nothing like that. And, and so it just, it just came out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. I, I think in, re, in retrospect, I'd been, well, I'd been very happy 
previous months. I've been away from home, traveling. I went, and my father had a colleague at his college who was from Argentina. And he, this very kind man, set up a job for me in Argentina. As so I went away for a gap year. It wasn't actually a year. I went for six months. And the first half of it, I was working in Argentina. And then I traveled through Bolivia and down into Peru. And along the way, I, I wrote what I hoped would become a book. And I already had a kind of literary aspiration. And my eczema during all that time was gone. It sort of miraculously cleared up. Mm. And I, I was sort of in a state of, uh, you know, fascination and, and interest and motivation and also very good things and great exploration. And, and I, I was also paying attention very attentively to things. I think because of writing this book, it sort of made me perhaps, yeah, more attentive generally. So when this, when this, I mean, somehow this sort of study of sunlight on water that mm -hmm. I was engaged in was of a piece with a kind of new interest in experience or something like that. So I think probably that played a part, but otherwise it came out of nowhere. Well, it's, it's funny, you know, obviously any phenomenon is in principle as good as any other to precipitate this recognition of the illusion of self or the illusion of subject object dualism. But I've always been a fan of that river of light you see when the sun is setting on the ocean. I mean, there's something about the million scintillating jewels that just as a visual percept, I don't know, is first among equals as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's a very good point. You know, well, well what, what happened was that it became, I was actually just, just if I may depart from the story a moment, I mean, mm. in Zen, you know, there are, there are these so-called koans, many of which kind of commemorate precisely sensory experiences that somebody had that triggered some kind of opening, mm. meaning exactly loss of separate separateness. And, um, it's, it's some are visual and many are auditory. Actually, there's a famous story about a master who was a brilliant scholar. And as a young, as a young man, he, 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 he went to visit a great old master who asked him a question. It's a famous Zen question. What was your original face from before your parents were born? And uh, he's called Kyogen, this guy. And he's said to have gone off and poured through all his texts and commentaries all night long and found nothing that was an adequate answer and come back crestfallen in the morning, said he couldn't answer the question and left the monastery and went off wondering for years, thinking he was sort of, he'd failed or didn't have what it took or something. And at one point he was, as an itinerant laborer, he was caretaking a, a shrine somewhere. And he, one morning he was sweeping and accidentally caught a little pebble in his broom that flew up and hit a, a big bamboo growing nearby. And when he heard the knock of this pebble hitting the, the, the stalk of the bamboos, he, he said, he, you know, he had some great awakening. And actually the way he expressed it was that he said, everything I've ever known, I've forgotten. Hmm. Everything I've ever known has vanished, you know? And I mean, that, that was his expression of it. And 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 his he was so there was an auditory one and <laughs> i think it can probably come through there's another case where somebody has their their robe or their shirt sort of pulled on by the master the master just gives the corner of their shirt a little tug and they they have a it precipitates a release of self or seeing through self well i, I want to dive in uh, there is deeply as we can go, but um, let's just spend another moment or two getting you to um, the path of Zen. So then how did, you, how did you land on Zen among all the other Buddhist schools you might have connected with? And, and just, then I actually do want to ask you about koan practice, because that, that's a practice I've never done at all, really, for, you know, formally or, or even informally. And I have my own intuitive sense of how it works, 
but I, I'm really a complete ignoramus on the topic, so I'd, I'd like you to explain the logic of it as well. But get us up to the, the moment where you became a student of Zen. Yeah, so I, I was, um, I'd been doing TM for several years. I'd started, I'd written a couple of books. I was, I was busy on, well, I, I had just signed a contract to write a third one. And it was, it was, uh, it involved sort of tracing the footsteps of D.H. Lawrence in New Mexico. And so I came out here at the age of 28 and I, I, I quickly happened to meet somebody who was a Zen practitioner and she, one afternoon, she just read me a little passage of the great Zen writer, poet, philosopher, Dogen, who was a 13th century Japanese master. Mm. And, you know, this, this passage was completely impenetrable and it made, it made absolutely no sense to me. But and it was only a paragraph about mountains walking. And I, I sort of, you know, scratched my head a bit and sort of reread it and kind of forgot about it. But I, but I found it, it kept sort of gnawing away at me over the next couple of days. And, and, and suddenly one, one, I remember actually I was in the kitchen cleaning a, a cup and I just suddenly, I just suddenly had this sense that Dogen must have been talking about what I'd experienced on the beach by now, you know, nine years earlier. Hmm. I just had this sense that, that that moment would somehow make sense of what Dogen was saying. I couldn't even really formulate why. It was an intuitive hunch, I guess. And, but it was enough to sort of make me think that perhaps there were people who had some idea of what had happened that then. And not only that, but had, had learned that it didn't have to just be a random moment that sort of somehow seemed a sort of a, a greater reality and then kind of closed and was gone and you had to forget about it because mm. it had been that that moment had been sort of one of one one of various stressors in my life like well you know i i felt you know that i'd seen something really something really important had happened then it seemed to sort of resolve life in some strange way and and um it's interesting though why didn't your exposure to tm open the door to the search for a, an Indian that is nominally Hindu guru. I mean, had, Cause that, surely that was getting advertised to you somehow in, in the context of being a, a student of TM, right? Well, that's a good question. I've asked myself that. I mean, for one thing, I didn't really want to participate in any kind of institutional anything, mm. you know, I, I, and, and I had a, from a young age, really a quite a, sort of rebellious resistance to any form of authority. I've been quite a rebellious kid and becoming a writer actually was almost sort of part of that. I wanted to be my own boss. So I didn't ever go, well, once I eventually did, but only after about four years did I ever go to a TM retreat. I went to a weekend once and I just had thought of the TM as a kind of medicinal remedial mm. therapeutic thing which i think for many it probably was or is or certainly can be and that's what it was for me and it just it just never occurred to me that it could have any window on that strange moment i'd had and it, i don't know it's maybe it was really obtuse of me but i didn't seem to get exposed in the tm world to Probably, maybe I just didn't expose myself to enough of it, but I never really got, I remember actually on that weekend retreat, there was basically, there was a group of us Londoners who went down to a big house in Surrey outside London and, and spent the weekend sleeping as much as we could because <laughs> TM was marvelous for sleep. Mm. And so, but, but every evening we were supposed to go after supper to a class where somebody kind of with a whiteboard explained these different levels of consciousness. And it was just, you know, it was utterly boring. You know, I just, I didn't really, most of us just yawned through it. Couldn't wait to get back to bed, you know? And right. 
certainly I didn't pay any attention. I mean, I, I noted it. And it also it wouldn't, even to what if, whatever extent I did pay attention, it didn't, it didn't even occur to me that what they were talking about might have something to do with what I'd experienced. Mm. I don't know why. I mean, I guess it was just dumb of me. Yeah, it's interesting what what you described there about the medicinal, you know, merely remedial capacity of TM received in that context is is certainly happening with mindfulness now for many people. It's just it's you know, as you know, mindfulness is ubiquitous in the culture, and many people are are engaging it very much in the mode of finding some technology, yet another technology that can help them optimize their performance in life and reduce stress. And it's a new exercise in a sense. And they really don't understand its fundamental power to you know, rewrite the firmware of their, of their engagement with reality. I, c I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, that's one reason I wrote my book. It's really emphasizing how powerful these practices can be. I mean, it's not and maybe it's more than firmware, it's hardware. I mean, mm. so much can be torn up and so that we enter the moment in a completely new way. And we can do, and, and again and again and again, you know, not, not replacing one view with another, but actually being able to, you know, sort of some sense sort of join the arising of everything in each moment. Mm. Yeah, so it's a totally different way of living. So then who was the first Zen teacher uh, that you you engaged, or how did you get into Zen? Yeah, well, actually, I you know I I um I having 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 made this connection with with Dogen and that beach moment, I then started doing Zen, and I after a while I went and did a a week long retreat that was very 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 difficult. I mean, I it was sort of grueling, but yeah. somewhere near near the end of it. I had another extraordinary random moment of revelation, really, where I just vanished. And, you know, there was, it was the most amazing thing. It was sort of, of course, related to what had happened on the beach, but different. And I've, I know I was very lucky that it should have happened kind of on, on the first long retreat I was doing. I'd never have gone back if it hadn't. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. uh, uh, you know, but it was, it was a sudden, really clearly just seeing that I, as I'd taken myself to be, had simply never really existed. I had just been a, I had conjured myself, you know, and, and it, and it was, it was just utterly marvelous to be freed of that, to see through that fundamental illusion that, you know, all along it had seemed so definite that there was this me to whom everything was happening. And that, you know, all the different experiences I'd had in life are all, they were all on a single thread and that thread was me. And to find that that me was, was simply a fabrication. You know, I, mean, I can remember it, it, it was, it was the most startling thing. It was like a flashbulb went off in my head and hmm. that's, that's what it revealed. And it was, I remember sort of trying to, exp there was a teacher actually on that retreat. Uh, a very nice guy called George Bowman. He was a Korean lineage Zen teacher from this very popular guy, Sang Sunim, I think it was called, or Sung mm -hmm. San, Sung San. A lot of people seem to read him still. And um, this guy, George, had trained with him and been authorized. Was he the husband of Trudy Goodman? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He so, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I know Trudy. I don't think I've ever met George, but I, 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 I know Trudy. Well, I mean, I think they, she was there on that retreat. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, uh, it was one of the first retreats ever held at a, a small and lovely retreat center way up in the mountains in New Mexico, actually. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, I mean, it was, yeah, yeah I, 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 it was, it was absolutely sort of, it was astounding to me. It was, it was different. It was so, it was so different from the experience I'd had on the beach, but somehow I knew they were of a piece. They were they were related in some way, you know, and they, and, and it was, and anyway, that, that was it, it, it after that, it took me ages to find a teacher. I, I didn't even, even then I didn't really want a teacher. 
I just wanted the mm. practice. You right. know, and I, I was very, very, like I said, I was very, I, start, I started going to this monastery in New York State, Zen Mountain Monastery, but I couldn't really, I was very good practice and I, I, I liked going in many ways, but I didn't like the, oh, the sort of the heavy kind of power trip going on and the, you know, I didn't like robes and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, basically it took, it took more or less something like another decade practicing a lot. I used to go to a Vipassana center also, and I was, I was teaching in Southern New Mexico at a university there. And there was a beautiful little Vipassana center up in the hills I used to go to. And, and I did some mindful, you know, MBSR training. I, I did a variety of things, but somehow Zen was always the thing that I knew that it knew. I could, most of all, I wanted help with these, you know, these sort of random moments of revelation that I somehow believed that Zen really kind of knew about. But it took a long time for me to find someone. I guess, you know, this, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. Well, I had many teachers appear, and apparently I wasn't ready. But eventually I did. I had an absolutely lovely guy from a lovely lineage that was much less formal that was actually still japanese i mean his master was japanese and they and they they didn't they didn't put all that emphasis on a sort of scary liturgy and you know it was it was informal yes they you lit incense before a talk and there was a candle with a buddha on it buddha behind it and so there was a little bit of liturgical formality i guess but you wore normal clothes you Mm -hmm. It was just had a sort of relaxed, warm atmosphere in the Zendo. And it was, I, I, I didn't like all that. I, I wasn't interested in adopting some other culture. And I was right. certainly wasn't interested in getting into a religious context, as I understood it. I mean, some people I know will, will argue with some plausibility that Zen is a religion. Uh, that's something I, we could definitely talk about if you're interested. Because for me, it's not. But it's, I would have to defend that position, I know. But anyway, eventually I did find back in my hometown of Oxford, actually, I had a fellowship there at Oxford Brooks University and we were living back there for a couple of years. And, um, there was a Zen center and there was this lovely guy teaching there who was a recently retired lawyer, sort of normal human being, not a, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't, he didn't look different, didn't act different. He just had some very deep practice behind him and you know he was able to yeah. articulate it beautifully and he was a koan teacher yeah so so this first retreat that you sat where you had another awakening experience was this a just sitting practice or was this koan practice yeah that's a good question actually i was asking the question who am i hmm. which he had suggested that is in fact we it's considered a koan in zen and um so I had just been gently sort of exhaling, who am I? I, mm. I wasn't, I wasn't actually, he just suggested, you know, anybody who wants to can try that. I wasn't particularly, I was, at the time I was just kind of desperate to be in less anguish because I was, you know, my knees were in great pain. My hips were uncomfortable. My, my skin was flaring up a bit and, you know, and, and, and mm. my mind was just a sort of maelstrom of, <laughs> of distressing thoughts uh, you know so i just wanted anything i thought well why don't i try the question maybe it'll help maybe it'll distract me and actually when i picked it up it it did bring a little bit of calm maybe used mantra style right but then i had a it was, i remember what I, we had one one afternoon where he he suggested we all sit outside and we were doing that and it was actually even more uncomfortable because the ground was uneven and one of my knees was just you know i thought i've got i've got to i've got to i've got to get up i've got to move i've got to do something but right then i heard the wind traveling through pine trees across across the field and 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 i just noticed wow they sound like a jet engine the way it's roaring and the wind is roaring in the trees and that was kind of interesting it's, uh, suddenly it's just felt nice to it felt something somehow like recovering some kind of innocent wonder or something just for a moment you know to be caught up in the quality of sound of the wind in the trees and and right after that this this yeah this flash 
revealed. I knew the answer to the question, who am I? You know, I'd found it. I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't here. Uh, I never had been. And, mm. and, the, and, and actually the same pain in my knee after that moment, I realized it was still there, but it had turned into a warm tingle that was not at all unpleasant. Well, I want to drill down as far as we can on this insight into the illusoriness of, of self. But before we do, I mean, and maybe this will be part of that conversation. I want to understand the koan practice because I'm, you know, I'm very familiar with the various ways one can be wordlessly paying attention to phenomenon or, or the, the awareness of phenomena and have that be the practice. But maybe you can describe and give a, a few examples of koans and, and just describe just the phenomenology of working with one and how that is a doorway into a, a kind of non-conceptual experience of consciousness in the present. Yes, yes, I'll do my best. It's, it's not entirely easy because it's, it's, I mean, you could say, yeah, you could say this initially that nearly all the comments are excerpts from the lives of enlightened masters who presumably have sort of gone beyond being caught by the illusion of self and are living in in some sort of you know slightly different kind of consciousness because of that one less dominated by sense of separateness and sense of self so they tend to be tiny little anecdotes from biographies where the master says or does something that makes no sense basically mm. and um, but the the presumption i suppose is that what they say or do does make sense from a very different perspective so one famous example of that is you know it's often actually used as a first koan is when a monk asks joshu or jiao Zhou, does a dog have buddha nature and joshu or jiao Zhou answers mu which literally means not but the I mean, this, this is weird. I mean, I, I know from, I've done a lot of mindfulness practice as well, and I can imagine how strange this might sound to somebody who's familiar with mindfulness practice of, 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 of various stripes, you know. Hmm. But why on earth would I want to occupy myself, my precious meditation time, with a <laughs> weird little story from early medieval China? And, you know, and in fact, you're told not even to think about the monk's question about the dog and Buddha nature simply, you know, simply sit with Joshu's answer of Mu. And the, the, again, the, I mean, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but the kind of the underlying notion really would be that somehow that little syllable from Joshu sort of preserves or contains Joshu's own state of awakening kind of, mm -hmm. which I know must sound rather hard to, to take actually, but, but, but it does kind of remarkably sort of work quite often that people sit with this little syllable move and if they're willing to do it and if they're, you know, by what, for whatever reasons feel it's worth doing and it, it does actually you know, not, not reliably, but somewhat regularly seem to precipitate moments of awakening. It, it did for me. I had, mm. uh, I'd been sitting with it for a while. I mean, of course this is by now, this is on the back of 15 years of regular daily sitting. And, and, and when I finally met this teacher, John, he was called, he, I started sitting sort of more seriously with Moo. I'd done it a little bit before, before. And, you know, again, one evening I'm bringing up a plate of food to my wife who's watching a movie with the two boys. And, um, and you know, all of a sudden the room just disappeared and everything just disappeared. I, there was still a sort of witness, but the contents of the moment 
outside the witness just sort of vanished and uh, you know I, I wouldn't have i mean you might think well why 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 give any credence to an experience like that but but you know it it, it came with a, again with a tremendous force of a sense of reality that and it was tremendously helpful it really it really sort of broke a number of strong attachments that were still mm -hmm. quite habit quite habituated and conditioned to me and and um you know and so a great joy comes with it, a great sense of deep deep belonging you know in 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 things and and sort of being wonderfully sort of intimate with things and 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 that was precipitated by working with moo why i i don't fully know but what i do know is that having had that experience with with the koan when i went back to see my teacher and started sort of reporting on this i realized almost immediately that he knew exactly what i was talking about and he recognized sort of what i was describing and actually i also talked to him about some of these earlier moments i'd had and he recognized them too in a way that wasn't just you know i could sort of feel that they found purchase in him sort of thing there was a real sense of him getting what i was talking about and then once once i'd done it with this koan we you know he started to question me about the koan in ways that again seemed ridiculous to me but I found answers spontaneously coming up that were apparently the traditional answers. So I began to get the sense that, wow, there is actually a kind of path of practice that takes you deeper into this, you know, this world of awakening that in a sense, I suppose, doesn't have depth, but you can get more and more grounded in it, or you can get more and more, you can integrate it more and more and more. And that's, Really, the path of koan practice is, after, is like that. After an initial breakthrough, a student will sit with koans, uh, many of them. In these, there's, there's certain sort of classical co collections of koans that you kind of work through. And you do it by presenting the koans. We're not really talking about them. You have to, you have to do something that shows, sort of brings the koans to life, sort of embodies each one as you go to the teacher. And, and you know you've either got the, the the traditional presentation or not. I mean, it's, I know it sounds very strange, I'm sure, but it's very very powerful because what it does mm. is gradually it allows sort of you know awakened heart mind or whatever to 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 become integrated into everyday life. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I'll give you the. My take on Zen in general, and and just how it's how I'm kind of filtering through it in this conversation, because I, I've I've never been a direct student of Zen, but you know I've you know, obviously read many of the books and I formed a, an impression of it, you know, being very engaged with other types of practice, and so it's it's always had this kind of dual place in my mind, which is you know one is kind of especially well regarded and one is kind of derogatory and so that on the plus side it's always had this mystique about it and it's always had an aesthetic that i prefer to many others i mean it doesn't have the garish almost hindu level of religiosity and you know iconography that you get in tibetan buddhism if you go through the front door of course you know within tibetan buddhism if you go through the back door you you hit zogchen and it becomes very zen and spare but this sort of explosion of mythology you get in the front of Tibetan Buddhism has, has never been something that I found attractive. So Zen, as most people know, has a, a very stripped down spare in the Japanese context. The Zen rock garden aesthetic and the temples are very beautiful and it has a kind of martial attitude, which is... Um, the samurai sword version of the dharma which is on one level attractive although on another level that it has the liability that you can you can hang around for a long time and seem not to get the compassionate side of buddhism it would seem and and the fact that zen got somehow leveraged into the kamikaze suicide 
bomber moment in in World War II in Japan. I mean, it was it got wrapped up with Shinto and and just the Japanese martial attitude in general. That wasn't a total surprise, whereas it would have been more surprising with Tibetan Buddhism, although not impossible, and and perhaps more surprising with Theravada Vipassana, although also not impossible. So there's that side of it, and more more on the plus side, it, it's always had a promise of of real integration in life, where the you know the profundity of everyday moments equalize the you know what's available in practice and what's available in life. And it seems like you get that message very early on. This is it's, this is not about becoming a meditator. It's not about spending years on retreat. It's about recognizing the way life actually is. And uh, you know, many Zen books communicate this early and often in a way that makes the practice not seem linear or merely progressive in in the normal way. It makes the goal seem more immediate rather than by definition, far away. And you get this, you know, reading a book like Suzuki Roshi's famous book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, that that comes through. But the problem for me with Zen, and it comes out a little bit in this conversation, and and I want to see if we can help people cure this part of it, you know, in their own experience you know, directly, it's always seemed to rely on paradox and ambiguity to a degree that seems unnecessary to me. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun, and you know, some of the, the Zen literature is fun in a way that that is that is certainly you know the, the Theravada literature isn't. But this reliance on paradox and and ambiguity, I, I've always assumed leaves practitioners in a place of not knowing whether they're doing the practice right for far longer than seems optimal to me. I mean, I, I could imagine if I had been a student of Zen sitting for a very long time, you know, with exploding knees on retreat, just not knowing whether or not I was, quote, doing it right. And there really is a, there, there really is a difference between doing it right and not. You know, I mean, if you're just left with your confusion on any path of meditation, that is different than having a you know a very clear insight into the selfless nature of consciousness and being able to do that every time you become mindful again that's the background context in which i think about zen so you started with this kind of quasi koan of, of who am i the first question you were given and for me that's a very straightforward pointer to the nature of mind and and, and it appears in many other contexts i mean ramana maharshi would in the Advaita Vedanta context would, you know, that was the path of self-inquiry. And so that doesn't seem paradoxical or illogical. That really does seem like a stepping stone that could be useful. And another version of this, which I don't know where it comes from, it might even be Zen, but there's another question of this sort that has always struck me as a kind of koan that that I can really work with and or recommend, which is if you look at anything in your sensory environment, you know, now I'm looking at a pen, and you ask, what is it? It's possible to, I mean, obviously the word pen recommends itself as, you know, an answer, but if you push past that and you realize pen is just a word, right? This is just a, a sound that is happening, you know, in the with the voice of your mind, but that word doesn't reach in to the reality of this visual percept. And if, if you kind of push past that and, and again ask the question, what is it? You can recognize that it is absolutely mysterious as an appearance. I mean, and, and whatever concepts you are going to marshal in the face of that mystery, again, they slide over it or drop on it and kind of wash away. They don't penetrate it. They don't actually reduce the mysteriousness of it. And that's true with absolutely anything you could ask this question of. Again, that is a kind of stepping stone into this non conceptual, open engagement with the present moment. But when you take me all the way to Mu, I feel like I could probably work with this, right, given my other experience. But I do see the possibility of a student being given that koan and just making no progress at all for the longest time. And so I, 
I know I've given you a lot to react to here. So I just push that all to your side of the table and, <laughs> and await your answer. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, then, look, I, I would, I would, I would on the whole sort of actually agree with, with what you're saying. By the way, what is this or what is it? Mm -hmm. That is a, that's a question that comes up in, that is a Zen koan. I mean, I'm sure it comes up in many other contexts as well, but we, that's considered one of the basic early koans as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, you know, first of all, in my own case, I was lucky in that I didn't start with Zen. And I right. think that's probably good fortune. I nowadays as a Zen teacher, I encourage, I don't, I don't think people should start sitting with Mu for quite a while, you know, and if at all, it's not like everybody has the right sort of temperament or need for doing or likely benefit from doing koan study. It's just not for everybody. So as a teacher, my, my method, I'm always sort of evolving, but at the moment is I'm teaching basic mindfulness to begin. Mm -hmm. I think people should know, should have easy tools for sort of working with present moment experience, including difficulties that will come up sort of, you know, what traditionally be called the five hindrances. People should know about them and sort of have ways to work with them, be able to parse out interior experience into, you know, internal talk and internal image and, and, and emotion sensation in the body. I mean, somewhat actually in the kind of remedial way that we were talking about earlier, I think there's a right. important place for that. I, and you know, the fact that I, I got to Zen when I'd already done several years of that kind of practice and probably in a sense, I was then ready to switch from a, yeah, a more therapeutic practice to a more investigative one. And, but I, I don't feel that, I mean, many people, I see many people who've been long time Zen practitioners, actually, who, who are trying out a new teacher or whatever, who I think really need to do mindfulness practice. And I teach them that. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel I'm doing, I am probably departing a little bit from the most traditional ways of doing Zen, but that seems perfectly reasonable and sensible to me. I'm part of a, you know, I'm part of an organization, an international group of of Zen teachers and students, you know, called Sambo Zen, which still has a Japanese abbot, but he's a very, he's a sort of, a, well, he's lived in London a lot. He lived in Boston. He's fluent in English and he's a businessman and he's sort of, I mean, he's he literally, he runs a big company as well as being a Zen teacher. So he's, he's kind of in, in the world in that way we were talking about earlier. He's a good example of that, but at the same time, he's not, um, sort of hide bound by old ways of doing Zen. And, um, he's not somebody who's big on, you know, liturgical practice. I mean, actually for all you were saying that I do entirely agree with about the stripped down nature of Zen, all that's true, but actually there's, you know, there are whole schools of Zen that place a lot of emphasis on liturgy. It may be mm -hmm. largely black and white, but it's still liturgy, you know, with right. chanting and drums and bells and, you know, it, it, all the giant Buddhas and stuff. And, you know, personally, I, I, I find that I can't understand why anybody would do that, but from another country, but I mean, I, I, well, I sort of understand, I'm sure there's a lot of wisdom in it and so on, but you know, my view actually, Sam, there was something else you said. I do, do want to speak to you about what about the compassion? Where does that show up? Well, that's a, that's a very important point. And again, I think I was probably a bit sort of lucky in the sense that I realized quite early on in my Zen sitting that it was all about the heart. And I felt this sort of, I'd come into the, the Zendo and, or I'd get on my little cushion at home and, and I'd, I realized that if I didn't sort of connect with some, some kind of tenderness in, inside myself, it was going to be difficult. Mm. And the, 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 con the simplicity of the Zendo with this very sort of, and by the way, this became much clearer to me once I'd found the, the teacher that I was talking about earlier, but I, I'd already sort of picked up on it that somehow you, you couldn't really do it unless you were 
finding a, a warmth and tenderness in your own heart, that that was what it was really about, but it was kind of hidden. Now you could say, well, why hide it? Why not make it more front and center? And I would tend to agree with that question. And in fact, I mean, my way of teaching it for what it's worth, one of my ways anyway, is that I, I really um, try to help people regard it initially as a path of healing. That the, mm. the, the difficulties and, you know, wounds and the uncomfortable conditioned habits and commonly anxiety, you know, they're welcome. And we want to be cultivating a kind of mindset that provides an internal context that gives them space. So it's okay to be feeling ill at ease in, in various ways. It's okay. You know, that's not a, I mean, I would see that as a first step toward actually having less anxiety. So, you know, beginning where we are, so to speak, and being able to sit with difficulty is mm -hmm. absolutely crucial. Now, you know, some, I, I don't know whether this is particularly pertinent, but historically early Chan or Zen, you know, Zen was called Chan in China. Early Chan practice had the four foundations of mindfulness explicitly as a practice. It had two main practices, interestingly. And, then, and one old early Chinese master said that it's like a cart track. You have two ruts, one for either wheel, you know, and one rut was four foundations of mindfulness. And the other rut, was what he called principle. And that means something like what probably you and I might call awakening. You know, the principle of non-separateness, of non-duality, of no self, you know. And, and, and he thought this guy, actually right now, his, his name is eluding me. He thought you needed both ruts. And when, when he said that, I think he meant not necessarily that each practitioner needed both, although maybe they do, maybe we do, but, but at least that a, a, body, a, a body of teaching needs both. And, you know, it seems to me now that we're, in another way of looking at what, what we're talking about right now, for me would be like the seventh and eighth folds of the eightfold path. You know, the seventh, when Buddha, you, you know, I'm sure a lot of the listeners know Eightfold Path is basically sort of starts out with view and wisdom and sort of understanding things clearly. Then the th second sort of package is ethical living and how important that is. And then the third is meditation practice. And, and among the, the little cluster of three elements of meditation practice, one is learning how not to encourage unwholesome mental states. You know, so that's, that's a thing in itself. But then, and of course, practice helps with that. And then the second two are mindfulness and concentration. And, you know, perhaps one could plausibly argue that mindfulness is more about a sort of general healing of, of one's own well-being that will then lead, spill over into well-being, being encouraged through interaction with others and causing less harm and less suffering to self and others. Mm. And then concentration practice or dhyana, which is the word, you know, dhyana became chan and became zen. I mean, it's the same word, sinicized and then japanicized, whatever the word is, Jap <laughs> japanized, I don't know, you know, zen. It's dhyana practice, it's concentration practice. It's, that's the thing that it came to emphasize was, you know, really going deep into your concentration, your samadhi, you know, and getting in that sort of narrow channel. I mean, there's one great master actually, Da Wei, 11th century Chinese master, who actually said, you know, when somebody sits with Mu, he said, it's like a, a rat, an ox horn rat trap. What he meant by that was they had these traps for catching rats, which would be a, you know, a hollow ox horn with a little drop of sweet oil down at the tip inside. And the rat would go in trying to get closer and closer to the oil at the end and find that it had got itself stuck in the trap. 
And mm. he was describing Mu practice in that way. And you think, well, why on earth would somebody want to do that? To get stuck in a rat trap. But <laughs> he regarded it as very, very beneficial because in the midst of that constriction and confinement and constraint, you could suddenly find boundlessness, you know, sort of right. Hamlet style, bounded in a nutshell, king, queen of infinite space. You know, that, that, that's actually real. You know, that's not, it's not just poetic talk. It can, it can happen, and Mu practice can, can do that. But having said all that, I mean, basically, I totally agree with you that it's not, I don't think it is very smart for beginners to just start out with that. They may well get little benefit. On the other hand, there's a far more likelihood, far more chance they'll get a lot of benefit from getting able to sort of parse out present moment experience through, through some basic mindfulness. And so, mm. I mean, I, 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 I don't really want to be defending a traditional Japanese way of doing Zen too much. I'm prepared to defend half of it or, you know, half of what I do would be strongly in defense of that. But another half is not because I just don't think right. it's, it's smart for most people. I'm, in other words, I'm really agreeing with you, but I'm also saying yeah. that the tradition, the tradition does actually in its earlier origins. And by the way, all the koans are about Chinese masters from the, a few Indian, uh, you know, they, they tend to be about the Tang dynasty masters who were sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth century in China. And so the Japanese look back to them very much. And, um, so I find, and so do my sort of cohort of colleagues and stuff, we tend to be really studying those Chinese masters. And the Japanese brought all very beautiful things to Zen, and they probably emphasized the beauty or the, the cultivation of the sense of beauty, an open sensitivity to beauty, more than the Chinese had done. But they did, I agree. They also brought in this sort of samurai spirit. I, mean, I think it, is, it predates the Second World War, by the way, I think. And, and that's something that doesn't sit very comfortably with a modern, you know, non-jingoistic, secular person. Whereas I think all the deep insight into the nature of things, you know, if we make, make that claim, does can sit perfectly well with a secular Westerner. Yeah, so let's start at what I imagine is kind of the ground condition for virtually anyone who could be listening to this conversation. I think I can put this in entirely non-sectarian, secular terms, although I get, maybe I'll plant a flag where I think the relevant 